Hi, I'm Dr. Scott Cleos, and today we're talking about vitamin D. In 2017, vitamin D has become the miracle cure du jour and probably with good cause. We are finding that most of us are deficient in this particular family of compounds with significant health ramifications, including osteoporosis, heart disease, and an increased risk of certain cancers like breast, prostate, and colon, just to name a few. Over the next few minutes, we're going to go into some detail of what is vitamin D, how do we get it, and what we can do to maintain adequate levels to ensure maximum health benefit. But first, what is a vitamin? A vitamin is any group of organic compounds that are essential for normal growth and health maintenance, which are required in small quantities of the diet because they cannot be synthesized by the body. In fact, the word vitamin is a concatenation of the words vita, Latin for life, and amine, English for amino acid, as vitamins were originally thought to all contain amino acids when the term was coined near the beginning of the 20th century. We now know that this is not the case, and as such, the original spelling, vitamin with an E at the end, was shortened to vitamin when scientists learned the true nature of these organic compounds. As we're going to find out momentarily, if we strictly adhere to the definition prescribed, vitamin D shouldn't be considered a vitamin at all, but more on that in a moment. First, I want to go into a little bit of chemistry, and I'm not going to lie to you, we're going to go into a lot of detail. And some of you are going to look at that first molecular model and freak out and get a little edgy, and some of you are just going to reflexively turn the video off, but I'm going to beg you to wait. We're going to break this down for you, show a lot of nice graphics and basic explanation, because frankly, I find this whole vitamin D biochemical process absolutely amazing. And I'm hoping by the end of this presentation, you too will find it pretty impressive. So unless you have a true Helenologophobia, literally a fear of Greek words, aka a fear of complex scientific terms, let's get started. Vitamin D actually refers to a family of organic molecules that are found in various foods including fatty fish, egg yolks, liver, and mushrooms. Whole cow's milk contains trace amounts of vitamin D naturally, which varies from farm to farm based on the animal's sun exposure. But dairy is often fortified with added vitamin D. Some cereals also boast vitamin D fortification, but as we'll find out momentarily, not all fortification is the same. Unlike most vitamins, the majority of land-based vertebrates with sufficient sun exposure can produce their own vitamin D through a complex interaction of ultraviolet B rays with the skin and subsequent modification of the organic molecule in the liver and kidneys, which we're going to describe in some detail momentarily. As we discussed in a previous video, the skin is broadly divided into the deep and superficial layers of the dermis and epidermis respectively. The epidermis is further divided into five or six layers with the deepest two layers, the stratum basale, or basal layer, and the stratum spinosum, or spiny layer, containing an organic cholesterol-based compound known as 7-dehydrocholesterol, or provitamin D3, constructed of 27 carbon atoms, 44 hydrogen atoms, and a single oxygen giving a chemical formula of C27H44O. Now at first glance, this molecule looks daunting, but basically it consists of three connected hexagonal rings of carbon labeled A through C, a single pentagonal ring labeled D, and a linear carbon backbone emanating from the pentagonal ring. The carbons are labeled 1 through 27 using a standard numbering protocol, but the two most important carbons are number 1, located here, and number 25 on the other side of the molecule. Reviewing some very basic organic chemistry, each carbon atom in the molecule has to have four connections to other atoms. Sometimes a double bond will account for two of the four connections, but no matter what we do to the molecule, the four connections per carbon has to be maintained. Similarly, each hydrogen atom has one connection, and the oxygen atom always has two connections. For clarity purposes, I put a few of the hydrogens on the back side of their carbon atom, but if you stop the video and do the accounting, the four connections per carbon is maintained throughout. I also want you to notice the 3D configuration of the molecule. As you can see, some of the side groups project in front of the main molecular plane. Pay particular attention to the oxygen and hydrogen combination or hydroxyl group off of carbon 3 in the first hexagonal ring as this will be important in a moment. 
On a graphic representation of the molecule, this anterior out-of-plane projection is represented by a solid triangular link to the side group. Atoms projecting behind the main molecular plane, on the other hand, are represented by a dashed triangular link as seen here. When 7-dehydrocholesterol in the stratum basale and stratum spinosum is exposed to ultraviolet B light, the energy is absorbed by the molecule and breaks this particular bond between carbon-9 and carbon-10, linking the A and B hexagonal rings, effectively disrupting the second hexagonal ring. Since we've lost this connection, we now have to rearrange the atoms and remaining bonds to maintain the requisite four connections per carbon and one connection per hydrogen atoms, respectively. To accomplish this, one of the hydrogen atoms on this methyl group off the first hexagonal ring moves to the now free carbon atom on the C hexagonal ring, completing the four connections on this carbon and creating a methylene group off the first hexagonal ring. In addition, the UVB-induced loss of the original bond and the transfer of the hydrogen atom off the methyl group produces a single bond deficit between these two carbon atoms, each of which now only contain three connections to other atoms. Fortunately, carbon has the ability to create single, double, and if necessary, triple bonds with other atoms. This particular bond deficit is rectified with the creation of a double bond between these two atoms, completing the requisite four bonds per carbon. At this point, the modified molecule, still with the chemical formula C27H44O, undergoes a conformational change rearranging some of the atoms in 3D space. Basically, the first hexagonal ring now rotates around this double bond of the disrupted second hexagonal ring. Before we do the rotation, I just want you to take note of the position of the carbons number 1 and the hydroxyl group off carbon number 3, again currently projecting anterior to the main molecular plane. As we rotate around the double bond, carbon number 1 moves to this position, and the hydroxyl group off of carbon 3 now projects posterior to the main molecular plane. We'll go back and forth one more time to solidify that conformational shift in your mind. This new molecule, still with the same chemical formula as the original 7-dehydrocholesterol, is called cholecalciferol or vitamin D3 and is the main molecular additive put into fortified foods such as milk and cereal. On a graphic depiction, notice the hydroxyl group of carbon-3 is connected with a solid triangle on the original 7-dehydrocholesterol molecule and with a dashed triangular link on the cholecalciferol molecule indicating the now posterior position. Although the new molecule is called vitamin D3, this is not yet the active form of vitamin D. The molecule has to undergo further revisions in both the liver and kidneys. At this point, vitamin D3 is transported through the bloodstream and brought to the liver where it undergoes its first revision. Here in the liver, an oxygen atom is added to the 25th carbon, changing the chemical formula to C27H44O2. Notice that, despite the additional atom, all chemical binding rules are maintained with four connections to the carbon atom, one to the hydrogen, and two to each of the oxygen atoms. Again, an oxygen and hydrogen together is called a hydroxyl group, and therefore, this process is referred to as the first hydroxylation of the vitamin D molecule. The new molecule is known by a few names, such as 25-hydroxycholecalciferol, 25-hydroxyvitamin D3, or calcifidiol. The new molecule is again transported via the bloodstream to the kidneys where it undergoes a second hydroxylation, adding another oxygen atom to the first carbon and changing the chemical formula to C27H44O3. The new molecule also has multiple names including 125-dihydroxycholecalciferol, 125-dihydroxyvitamin D3, or simply calcitriol. This is the active form of vitamin D that facilitates strong bones, heart health, and protection from certain forms of cancer. Doctors have known for many decades that sun exposure prevented rickets and helped maintain bone health. Here's a photo of a group of young patients and their nurse attendants all wearing protective glasses playing in a solarium or room bathed in artificial UV light with their skin exposed to protect them from rickets. 
In the early to mid-1900s, Professor Adolf Wendaus, a German chemist, was able to delineate the critical step in this complex biochemical process, specifically the conversion of 7-dehydrocholesterol to pre-vitamin D3 under the influence of UV light and thus provide the photochemical explanation of the benefits of limited sun exposure. Wendaus was awarded the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1928. As you can see, in the appropriate clinical setting with sufficient sun exposure, our bodies are capable of producing vitamin D and therefore, by definition, here in the sunshine state of Florida, vitamin D shouldn't even be considered a vitamin at all and is more appropriately classified as a hormone. It's estimated that, in fair-skinned people wearing shorts and a tank top, 10 minutes of full sun exposure near midday with no sunscreen provides about 1,000 international units of vitamin D. Darker-skinned individuals, like Hispanics, may need 15 to 20 minutes, and some African Americans with really dark skin and the elderly may need up to an hour of exposure to obtain these same numbers. In addition, the first step in this whole process, the conversion of 7-dehydrocholesterol to pre-vitamin D3 by UVB light, is dose-limited. In other words, as the concentration of the pre-vitamin increases, the conversion process becomes less efficient a built-in feedback mechanism to prevent overdose. So longer times in the sun won't increase your dose of vitamin D, just your risk of developing skin cancer later in life. Remember moderation. Just because a little sun is good, a lot of sun is not necessarily better. In reality, however, with our busy schedules, overzealous use of sunscreens, and in many locales, unfavorable environmental conditions, we're finding a lot of us are deficient in vitamin D and may require supplementation to meet demand. Before we get into supplementation, there is one more form of vitamin D we need to discuss, namely vitamin D2, also known as ergocalciferol. The term ergo is derived from the word ergot, or fungus. This form of vitamin D is produced in plants exposed to UV light, predominantly mushrooms, hence the name. The labeling on some boxes of mushrooms boasts that they are in fact high in vitamin D. However, there is a subtle but distinct difference between the animal form of vitamin D, or D3, and the plant-derived form, or D2, centered around carbons 22, 23, and 24 of the linear carbon backbone near the far end of the molecule. First, there is a double bond between carbons 22 and 23. Doing our chemical bond accounting, we see this double bond creates five attachments to both carbon 22 and 23, one too many on each carbon. If we take one hydrogen atom away from each of these carbons, we've restored the requisite four bonds per carbon. We're going to need these hydrogen atoms in a moment, so we'll just place them over here for now. Off of carbon 24, there is an additional carbon atom requiring four connections. One of these comes from the bond to carbon 24 itself, one from the hydrogen atom that was there previously, and we can use our two freed up hydrogen atoms from carbons 22 and 23 to complete the connections. So, from a molecular standpoint, the net difference between D2 and D3 is a single carbon atom with the chemical formula of D3, again C27H44O, and D2, C28H44O. I find it absolutely amazing that both humans and mushrooms can produce almost the same exact molecule when exposed to UV light. Kind of makes you think we may have been related eons ago. Assuming healthy and functioning kidneys and liver, both molecules can then undergo two hydroxylations at carbons 1 and 25 to produce the active forms of vitamin D. It was once thought that both forms of vitamin D were clinically equivalent, but the latest research suggests that the activated form of vitamin D2 may be up to three times less effective in the human body than the native animal-derived vitamin D3. Therefore, when buying vitamin D-fortified foods or supplements, I would suggest reading the label to ensure fortification is with the vitamin D3 or cholecalciferol rather than the less expensive plant-derived D2, also known as the vegan vitamin D or ergocalciferol. Vitamin D supplementation recommendations seem to be in flux in 2017, but currently the FDA suggests 600 international units a day from ages 1 to 70 and 800 international units a day for adults greater than 70. Again, in the appropriate environment with full UVB exposure on fair skin, 
our bodies produce about 1,000 international units in 10 to 15 minutes, with no real advantage or increase in production with extended exposures. As such, many believe that current recommendations may be suboptimal. Using nature as a guide, 1,000 international units daily may be ideal and probably best obtained naturally from limited sun exposure a few days a week if you live in a favorable location. For you cave dwellers and Londoners with healthy livers and kidneys, consuming D3 fortified food products and supplements to reach that 1,000 international unit mark may be your best option. Remember, however, moderation is key. Don't get caught up in the hype thinking mega doses of vitamin D are going to help you live forever. As always, the poison is in the dose. Water will kill you if you drink enough of it. So, in summary, to maintain adequate levels of vitamin D, first get a little sun if possible. Consume your D3-rich or fortified foods and supplement if necessary. We'll see you next time.